talk today about size, because we think size does matter. Small, medium, large, extra large. These are categories that we as Americans are all too familiar with. We see these in our food, in our clothes, in our furniture, our transportation. We even think about our homes in terms of size. We have the starter house, the tract house, the four over four, the mansion, and yes, even the McMansion. We're architects, and we design many different kinds of buildings, including very large houses and very, very small houses. And one of the first questions we get asked when people see our work is, how many square feet is it? And what usually follows right on to that is, how much did it cost per square foot? Now, these aren't unreasonable questions given how we think about our houses today. Um, they're signifiers of social status. Um, they're the basis of financial planning strategies, especially when it comes to resale. But I think the what the conversation doesn't usually incorporate is the big question, which is, how much space do we actually need in our houses? Um, so it wouldn't surprise you to think, given these attitudes, um, to know that the average size of the American house has inflated dramatically in the recent past. In 1950, the average size of a house was 983 square feet. That's average size. That's barely a one-bedroom apartment today. In 2000, that had inflated to 2,500 square feet. And today it's at 2,600 square feet. So um, when... Um, it, this is all during a time when average household size has been decreasing from 3.3 people to 2.5. So even though it's true that houses are getting bigger as family size is getting smaller, this really misses the key shift that's happened in this country. The population shift is dramatic. Eric Kleinenberg, a sociologist at NYU, wrote a book about this a couple of years ago, after the 2010 census came out. And he showed that in 2000, I'm sorry, in 1950, fewer than 9% of American households were occupied by single people living alone. But by 2010, that had swollen to 27% of households were single person households. So singles are making up a greater proportion of our population. There are many reasons for this. Some of this is choice, and most of it is, in fact. Recent college graduates, millennials, feel that having a place of their own is a rite of passage. People after a divorce feel that living on their own again feels like a sense of liberation. And older people especially, they resist firmly moving in with relatives or going to a retirement community because for them, home is a symbol of their independence. And interestingly, married couples in Sweden even report that having separate homes is what contributes to their marital harmony. Along with these social changes, there have been a lot of changes in the way we use our homes, especially amongst the youngest and oldest populations. Uh, dining is one example. Today, 50% of our dining is done outside the home. That's doubled in the past uh, 50 years. And the way in which we use the kitchen in our house has changed as well. There's the standard cooking, but then there's also the demonstrational cooking, which, be which cooking becomes a hobby or a presentation technique. There's also the heat and eat utility meal, which involves two appliances, a microwave and a refrigerator. Um, in, um, in addition to this, uh, there have been other changes that have gone on. Um, uh, we used to have funerals in our homes. That was outsourced long ago. But uh, today, other celebrations and family get-togethers, including birthday parties, and even the sacrosanct uh, American ideal of the Christmas dinner and Thanksgiving dinner have been shuffled off to restaurants. So um, other changes have occurred. Grooming is one. Uh, we've always had beauty salons and barber shops, um, but now there's a whole host of micro-grooming facilities, um, nail salons, threading salons, waxing parlors, uh, day spas. Things we used to do in the privacy of our own home are now getting uh, sent to commercial or public spheres. Um, so we talked about a lot of what doesn't happen in that today's house, but what does happen? Well, it's become very fragmented and individualized based on personal preferences and private screens. Um, the idea of a family um, sitting around 
in one place doing the same thing at the same time has become uh, much less prevalent. Um, you know, in these photos, you can see, um, you know, standing around a fire, sitting around a fireplace, having a conversation, or standing around the piano, singing, even sitting on the same couch watching the same TV show has become a distant memory, if a memory at all. But then look at our typical house plan. You see a lot of boxy rooms uh, with names for functions that have gone away long ago. Like, what exactly do you do in a great room, or a parlor, or e even a den, or a foyer, or a nook? Um, a lot of the ways which we design our houses is based on assumptions from the distant past or a lot of inertia on the part of architects and uh, builders. So what if you tossed out all these assumptions? What if you tossed out the external drivers of square footage and required rooms and resale value and social standing and just looked at the actual activities and needs that we need to, that we need to accommodate in our homes? Well, some architects are doing just that. And the reason that we know this is true because we have evidence of new types of housing that are showing up all over the country. We see a proliferation of micro-unit apartment buildings and tiny houses. Micro-unit apartment buildings are showing up in many city centers where tiny houses are spread across the entire country. NYU's Furman Center, one of the country's leading centers for housing research, released a report on this just last year. Now over 20,000 micro units have been built, are in construction, or have been permitted. Urban Land Institute released another report about this just a couple of months ago. But if reading academic white papers isn't your thing, there's plenty of popular magazines, television shows, and websites devoted to living small. So people who move into micro units, they have very small private spaces, usually between 225 and 450 square feet for their apartment. But these buildings always come with shared amenities. So the people, what they give up in personal space, they gain in shared or public space, whether that's a lounge, a screening room, a fitness center, a bike room. They also have what people in Boston like to call a 20-minute life. They're more connected to entertainment nodes and transit centers. So within 20 minutes, they can have their work, their exercise, their friends, and their entertainment, all within 20 minutes of where they live. But this isn't just an urban phenomenon, as we said. There are tiny houses all over the country, and now they're starting to cluster together in communities. And these communities also have shared amenities, like gardens, garden sheds, tool rooms, workshops. Portlandia has even done an episode about this. I think that's when you know something's firmly a part of the zeitgeist. But in cities with their micro units and in rural or smaller towns with tiny houses, this clearly is showing that square footage is dropping away as the prime criteria of desirability. Right now, these are anomalies. But the fact is, these are happening, and we see the trend going nowhere but up. What we give up in personal space, we gain in terms of community, and our, these meet our needs for sociability, for connection to transit and social networks, and the shared goals of reducing the impact on the climate by literally having a smaller footprint. So from an urban design and environmental point of view, this is very good news. It is good news, but we don't think it's good enough. And that's because the design of these micro houses and uh, tiny apartments is still based on models from the past. Um, if you look at them, there's still a single empty box that you fill with other stuff, your furniture, your appliances, other designed items. And in a way, this new form of housing really harkens back to something very ancient, uh, the primitive hut. Now look at that in comparison to the cars we drive. The cockpit of a car is designed around function and efficiency. Um, items are designed within a millimeter uh, for maximizing the use of space. And things which enhance the driving experience, or safety, or function, or even saleability are retained and kept, and all else eliminated. It's a very Darwinian uh, industry. We think that, in a way, houses, and especially small houses, can become more like this, um, where items are integrated for function, and the house becomes really tailored and fitted to the individual using it, more of a bespoke architecture of sorts. So what we'd like to do now is show a couple of projects from our own office 
that demonstrate these ideas and how they've been incorporated. One of them is in a rural setting and one in an urban setting. The first of these is the Zero House, um, and that's in, for the rural setting. And it was designed around two very simple criteria. One was to live as comfortably as possible, and the second one was to live in complete harmony with the environment. And it was designed around a specific kind of lifestyle uh, that the owner requested, which was to be completely off the grid, and also to use outdoor space as your primary living um, areas. Uh, the Zero House works um, with a lot of integrated technology. On the, on the top is a large plane that has photovoltaics that produce electricity, which is stored in batteries below. This same plane also collects rainwater and funnels it into a filtration system and then tanks to store the water for later use. It has a digester system at the bottom of the house that processes all waste, and it integrates all this within a 650 square foot envelope. The interior works in a similar way. Walls are not walls. Walls become storage units. They become holders for entertainment systems. Lighting is integrated into the walls. The furniture is very built in. It's all a way we can live in a very tailored environment that fits the needs of this particular user. And even the foundation system is four posts that go into the ground, so it can be located in any kind of terrain or environment or even in water. In an urban environment, we designed something called the Manhattan Microloft. And this was designed for a working couple, both of whom work very long hours, travel frequently, and do most of their entertaining outside of the home. But when they come home, they want a place that's cozy and comfortable, that feel, felt like a retreat. Uh, and the reason this can work, this apartment is even more micro than the Zero House. It's only 425 square feet. And the reason this kind of a place can work is because so many of the elements do double duty. They function doing more than one thing at a time. So the kitchen countertop is also the entry console table. The main staircase is also the main storage bank. In small apartments, it's usually the bathroom and the bed that take up the most amount of space. But in this case, we were able to tuck the bathroom underneath the main stair and then cantilever the bed out from an intermediate stair landing. So everything here is, again, tailored and efficient to maximize comfort in a very small environment. These two examples in our office, the micro loft and the zero house, have really been stepping stones for us to begin thinking about what we're really trying to advance, which is a higher density urban living to really try to understand the people that want to live in micro-unit apartment buildings. And we've been talking to or working with developers in New York, Chicago, Austin, Mexico City, and as far away as London to bring forward this bespoke micro-unit apartment building. And we're really pleased to see that a number of other architects are doing the same. Building developers, enlightened city governments, and even bankers have started to come around and see the value and the demand for this new kind of housing. But what we're promoting is not just new kind of housing that could become trendy and fall away quickly, but something that has a true value and is better than what came before. You know, we deal more intimately with our homes than any other part of our lives, yet the way we go about Conceiving, designing, and building our homes often falls way behind other parts of our built environment. Uh, reducing the obsession with square footage has started to address this problem, but we think that by focusing more on the user and the social and uh, environmental context in which a house exists, we can have houses that truly suit us at every stage of our lives. Thank, Thank you. you.